What's good everyone, welcome back to another reaction video. Today, we are reacting to Game Theory, why Eevee is the missing link to Pokemon Evolution. There's a top of recommendations on my channel, on my uh, recommendation list on YouTube, and so I thought, why not? Because, plus I'm kind of curious, because... Uh, the Eevee line is my most favorite line in Pokemon Evolution. Because Eevee is such a unique Pokemon with its different forms and different forms of evolution. So, find it kind of curious. So, yeah. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button down below, hit the subscribe button to support the channel, support the content provided, and so on and so forth. Hit the notification button to be notified immediately when the new video comes out. If you have any videos that you would like to recommend, leave it down in the comment section below. I'll react to it as soon as possible. You have my word on that. The link to this video will be down in the description below, so if you want to see this video uninterrupted or anything like that, go ahead and click that. Uh, link down below. Also, be sure to give Game Theory some love and support for the video they made. Other than that, let's start this video, shall we? This episode finally solves the mystery of Pokemon Evolution. That's it. No cringy opening joke, no nothing. If you want to learn the truth about what's really happening when Pokemon evolve and how it applies to us, well then, this is the video for you. Plain and simple. Roll intro. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the self proclaimed Garbador of the Internet. With the release of Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu. Eh, debatable. But I really can't say anything about that, so yeah. Let's go Eevee, it seems like a fitting time to take a look at one of the most adorable Pokemon ever created. No, not Pikachu. Jeez, that guy gets enough screen time. We're talking about Eevee, who's unique within the uh -huh. Pokemon universe for being the first Pokemon to have branched evolution, i.e. the ability to evolve into one of several Pokemon, starting with three options in Generation 1, Jolteon, Flareon, and Vaporeon. <laughs> Tell me your favorite Eevee evolution in the count section below. Because I'm kind of curious through the list. Because in Gen 1, my favorite Eevee evolution was... Ironically... Flareon, but I soon figured out that Vamporeon had a bit more better stats here and there, so... Has just gotten ridiculous. You can now evolve into eight possible Pokemon, ranging from alien cubes to kawaii cubes to eco friendly cubes. Since then, there have been other Pokemon who've gotten access to branched evolution, but to this day, Eevee is still the king. And so I started to research Eevee's unique evolutionary abilities, and then pieces started to fit. Yeah. Favorite uh, Eevee evolution is Umbreon. Second favorite is actually Espeon, so <laughs> some people might think it's weird, but eh. To like uh, have those two as favorites, but well, I don't think people actually think it's weird because everyone has their own preference to it, so. Yeah, Umbreon's my favorite, and no matter what. Together, and then more pieces, and more. Until finally, the entire mystery of Pokemon Evolution lay solved before my eyes. That's right, Eevee is the key that solves what Pokemon Evolution actually is. For years, we've made jokes of, that's not how evolution works, and clearly it's not. But we've never been able to put a label on what is really going on. 
least until today. Today we solve the riddle that is Pokemon Evolution once and for all, and it all starts with this little guy. According to Eevee's Pokedex entry in Diamond and Pearl, Eevee is a rare Pokemon that adapts to harsh environments by taking on different evolutionary forms. If you squint at this explanation, it kind of seems to line up with the principles of evolution that were taught in school, where over time living organisms change their looks, traits, and abilities to adapt to their environments through Darwinian survival of the fittest, but the problem- Yeah, that does sound like it. Is that in Darwin's definition, this is happening over hundreds of generations. What's happening to Eevee is happening instantaneously when I shove a colored rock in its face. What we see happening in Pokemon would be like if I took a turkey to the North Pole, stuck it next to an iceberg, and suddenly it evolved into a penguin. While admittedly that would be really cool, and judging by yes, it would. the game freak seems to be for new Pokemon ideas sometimes, it wouldn't really surprise me for a Penki or Turgwin to be in Gen 8. It's just not the way things happen in nature. So evolution alone isn't explaining how Eevee's physical changes are happening. But believe it or not, there is, in fact, a scientific explanation for Eevee. Which is good, because I like Eevee and we already wrecked too many nice video game characters on this show. It's called epigenetics. Epigenetics is something that you don't usually get into unless you're epigenetics. major in college. So all you younger viewers, get ready to blow your teacher's minds when you drop this knowledge bomb in the middle of your lesson about Punnett Squares. Those are so, like, four years ago on this show. So what is is epigenetic. At its core, it's essentially the phenomena by which animals are born with one set of genes, but potentially have parts of their DNA that are locked at birth and can later be unlocked by certain things happening in the environment. If that sounds weird, think of it this way. You have a ton of DNA in your body. 2.9 billion base pairs. But not all that DNA is That's a lot. So, we have genetic coding within us that's locked. If I'm trying to understand this, Huh. That is a curious thought. Working all at the same time. Without getting into the nitty gritty of genetics, your cells have specialized proteins that turn off and on different genes throughout the course of your lifetime. When you're a kid, you have a lot of genes turned on to do things like grow your bones, build your brain cells, and create the hormones that make you fall in love with literally every creature that you pass in the school hallway. Later in your life, though, some of those genes get locked back up. When that happens, maybe your metabolism starts slowing down. You stop producing color for your hair, and it turns gray. As you get older, you have all the same genes that you started with on the day you were born, but how you look is depending on which ones are turned on and off. Your epigenetics. Right now, my baby Oliver has blonde hair, but Steph and I have brown hair. So, should I be worried about Steph's relationship with the milkman? Is Steph cheating on me? Of course not. At least, I, I, I don't think so. Steph! Steph, are you cheating on me? Oh, yeah, sure, that's what you would say. No, what's really <laughs> Right now, most of the genes in Oliver's system that produce melanin, which turns your hair brown, are turned off. Like, way off. Just like I had when I was his age. But when he gets older, those genes get activated. And his hair will turn brown just like ours. His physical traits will change as his genes turn on and off. Now, with animals, what epigenetic researchers have discovered is that some animals will be born with one set of genes, but potentially have parts of their DNA that can be unlocked by certain triggers in their environment. A great example of this are honeybees. Yeah, yeah, I know, I just dedicated an entire episode to bee talk as it relates to Pete Jet. Maybe I'm just going through bee movie meme withdrawals, I don't know. Bees are fascinating creatures, and in this case, they are the perfect EV example. So, like I covered back in that episode, makes sense. larva can grow into either a queen bee or a worker bee. What makes the difference here is the food that they're given at birth. Bees, given royal jelly, become a queen, while everyone else becomes a worker. So in this case, royal jelly is basically the evolutionary stone for bees, determining what form the larval bee evolves into. It even changes the bee physically, where, in their adult stage, queen bees and worker bees look way different. But, in their larval stages, they're practically identical. It's exactly like two different EV that wind up with two different appearances despite starting with the same looking Eevees. 
the queen and worker bees didn't start off as genetically different, but differences in their environment, the royal jelly, or lack thereof, led to wildly different gene expressions. And bees aren't the only place in nature where this happens. Another Eevee-like example happens in the Agouti mouse, which has a gene really? that changes the fur of its coat. These two mice are genetically very similar at birth, but due to differences in nutrition, they have very different gene expressions. With one having a gene expression that causes it to become obese and have lighter fur. Same DNA sequence, different phenotypes, all due to environmental factors. In humans, it isn't just hair color either. Case in point, diabetes. Specifically, type 2 diabetes. We're often told two type things two. about diabetes that seem in direct conflict with each other. First, that diabetes is a genetic disease. If your parents and grandparents had it, well, it's more likely to be passed down to you. But also, second, that poor diet and lack of exercise can be a cause of diabetes. So then, which is it? Is it a genetic thing that you're born with, or is it a condition that you develop from eating one too many solo Vermonster challenges at Ben and Jerry's? That is a dangerous prospect, by the way. Do not try to do a solo Vermonster. Oh, the Vermonster, you are so good. The answer is it's both. You might inherit a genetic potential for diabetes that's part of the DNA sequence that you're born with, but that diabetes may only get unlocked if you have the bad diet. And if you maintain a good diet, well, you might never have to suffer the diabetes that was encoded into your genes, as those genes remain turned off. Hmm, so basically, it's just more complicated genetics to the point that Something in our genetics could be unlocked or locked at certain points and given points of time, depending how we act and behave with our bodies. Okay, that makes sense. Never knew this, so this is pretty interesting. On the other hand, someone without a genetic predisposition for diabetes might never get it, no matter how many Big Macs they eat out of the way. And this kind of epigenetics perfectly lines up with what we know about Eevee. In order to become mm. a Orion, for example, a Pokemon not only needs to be exposed to a specific environmental factor, in this case the water stone, but also needs to have the right DNA sequence. Your Pikachu ain't gonna turn into a Vaporeon no matter how many water stones you chuck at it. That's because Pikachu wasn't born with the genetic potential to become a Vaporeon. Well, Eevee was. He needs both the genetic component, being born as an Eevee, and the environmental component, the water, <sighs> to produce the epigenetic result, Vaporeon. And since evolutionary stones are basically things from different environments given to different forms, that it makes sense, really. And where this whole thing starts coming together is when you stop and think about what doesn't change here. The DNA sequence that you were assigned to at birth. It remains the same. It's the thing that doesn't change when these genes are being expressed. Epigenetic changes will cause you to gain or lose certain characteristics, but you'll still always remain the same species. A queen bee and a worker bee are always just going to be bees. No matter what the fur coat looks like, that agouti mouse is always going to be an agouti mouse. As strange as it might seem, that stay the same species thing is actually the case for Eevee. Sure, exposure to a thunderstone will cause an Eevee to turn yellow and grow spiky quills and also somehow gain the ability to attack its foes with electricity, but if you leave it in a daycare with another Pokemon that loves it very, very much, it won't lay a Jolteon egg, it lays an Eevee egg. While Eevee and Jolteon might have different entries in the Pokedex, in biological terms, they appear to be the exact same species. The DNA sequence between the Eevee and the Jolteon has stayed the same. The only thing that's changed is what parts of the DNA sequence have gotten turned on. No matter how Eevee quote-unquote evolves, when it comes time to reproduce, it's always going to lay an Eevee egg. Sylveons don't lay Sylveon eggs, Flareons don't lay Flareon eggs, they don't pass their phenotypic traits onto their offspring. But what they do pass on is the genetic potential to express those phenotypic traits. Sure, mm -hmm. there are a few exceptions to this, like how Rosalia can give birth to either another Rosalia or the tiny Badoo based on whether it's holding a rose incense. But this also ties in with another part of epigenetic theory, which is natal conditions, the conditions of the mother during pregnancy, and how it can affect their offspring. You know, uh... allowed to do stuff like smoke or drink alcohol? Well, it's because those substances change the environment for the developing baby, just like a change in the environment for Eevee or a queen bee. This 
This one is just happening before the baby is actually born. In the case of alcohol, a change in the baby's environment can cause birth defects. Birth defects are simply just another name for a change in the gene expressions of the baby. Really bad changes in the gene expression of a baby, but still, that is what it refers to. Basically, from the second you have genes, you can have epigenetic differences based on your environment. And here's where it starts to get crazy when you apply it to Pokemon, because epigenetics goes way beyond just the evolutionary family. This issue of the egg actually unlocks the evolution of practically each and every Pokemon across all of these games. What we've been calling Pokemon evolution for literally decades is simply just epigenetics. Take a look at any other Pokemon, Charizard. For instance, if Charizard was a true evolution of Charmander, when you bred two Charizards together, you would be able to get another Charizard, because animals don't regress backwards in evolution. Having two Charizards get together to produce a Charmander egg would be the equivalent of breeding two cats together and getting yourself a saber-toothed tiger egg. Since that would be awesome. Evolved, that would be awesome. No one, you can't disagree with that. That would be awesome to see two cats actually making a saber-toothed tiger. From saber -tooth tiger, which would be the most awesome pet ever, but it's not the way genetics works. What this all tells us is that the basic DNA of that Charizard is still just a Charmander. Turning into a Charizard was only the gene expressions inside that Charmander changing. Certain genes for big scary fire breathing dragon monster got themselves turned on, and the environmental trigger that did it wasn't a stone, like in Eevee's case, but here it was battling. It was being forced to battle a lot in order to level up. And this is where all the pieces start coming together. You see, being forced into stressful situations, like a fight to the death, or I suppose a fight to the faint, is exactly the kind of thing that can affect the methylation of your genes and in turn affect how your body develops. Studies conducted okay. by rodents demonstrate how exposing rats or mice to stressful and threatening situations can affect the phenotype that their genes express. According to research done at Columbia University in New York, where rats were exposed to aggressive social interactions, i.e. a much lamer version of a Pokemon battle, in situations where the rodents were repeatedly defeated by larger, more dominant mice, some animals respond to the challenge by becoming more threat avoidant, which is a reasonable survival strategy. But another strategy was to rise to the occasion by becoming stronger and more threatening, almost like they were leveling up and gradually becoming stronger a lot. Ah, uh, okay. This actually goes well together, so... Okay. ...more of their genetic potential. Epigenetic theory even goes so far to explain why it's so hard to find upper-tier, higher evolutionary forms of Pokemon out in the wild. Why is it so hard to find a Blastoise swimming around, or a Venusaur tromping through the grass? Well, there are costs to being big. Bigger beasts need to carry a lot more weight, meaning that they need to have proportionally stronger legs and eat a lot more food. There's a reason why there's so many more termites and ants in the world than elephants and rhinos. But if a wild squirrel is just gonna live a peaceful existence out at sea, having a small body that requires less food to maintain is actually going to be a lot more evolutionarily advantageous. However, if that squirrel suddenly finds itself caught by a trainer and forced into a battle for its survival, or a battle for its trainer's glory and status on a regular basis, then what becomes most important is how good of a brawler it is, making evolution into a war portal and eventually Blastoise the single best way to ensure its chances of survival. It was mm. the environment being captured and forced into battles by trainers that forced the genes for giant turtle mech animal to turn on inside a squirrel. When in the wild, those sorts of genes would largely need to go unexpressed. They don't need them to survive. It's epigenetics in action. So there you go. You are now equipped to go around obnoxiously correcting your friends when they talk about Pokemon evolving. You could say something like, um, well, actually, Pokemon simply alter their phenotypic gene expressions through epigenetic signaling in their environment. And congratulations, no one will know what it means but you and me and all the other loyal theorists out there. But in the process, what we'll all understand is that what we've unlocked here today is a real biological principle that not only fits with what we observe in the Pokemon universe, but also fits the real models of how animals are born with unexpressed traits that can unlock when they encounter specific factors in their environment. It might seem... Yeah, that is a pretty interesting thing to figure out that what Pokemon do is actually the same we can do and what animals can do. It's actually pretty amazing, to be honest. Pretty fantastical when you use a leaf stone to turn into a leafion, but it's no different from the Goody Mouse growing yellow fur because of the nutrition it received. And it was all thanks to this little guy. Let's go, Eevee, indeed. But hey, that's 
Just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Quick reminder, game theory merch is... Yeah, no, I'm not... Alright. This is a fascinating thing to discover. The fact that, uh... Well, the genetic value of Pokemon is actually the similar to in real life. It's actually pretty amazing. No one would really have figured it out, so... Unless you'll try really hard to find what actually gives what value, I guess, in Pokemon. But then you're going to go into more complicated stuff, and then you're going to have to go into more value relatable stuff, and... Oh man, that's that's something to consider. <laughs> so yeah, that's just a pretty interesting thing. Hmm. Think that it would be that kind of an explanation. Hmm. Though I do guess that in the wild, uh, that some Pokemon will evolve due to safety precautions and all that. So. I think that's just going to be the case right there. Nothing. Other than that, there's nothing really else to know. I completely understand what was being said. Different, uh, different things that happen to them lead to different, th different parts of the genetics to be unlocked and have certain things going on there. Such as, well, the EV evolutions and all that, and the fight and flight instinct. That's, uh, that's another thing to note that's pretty amazing. But yeah, this is a pretty reasonable, understandable theory. And it makes so much sense that it actually sounds completely true. So nothing really to note that. It's hard to disagree with. So yeah, hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, hit the like button down below. Hit the subscribe button to support the channel and the content provided. Hit the notification button to be notified immediately when a new video comes out. Uh, the link to this video, once again, is in the description below. So if you want to see this video, be sure to hit that link. Um... And again, tell me what your favorite uh, EV evolution is. <laughs> I already said mine, it was Umbreon, so yeah. Tell me yours in the comment section below. I'm kind of curious about what your favorite EV evolution is. So, with this all said, I'll see you all next time. Bye!